Hey guys, um, during my last training session, uh, my coach showed me a game that I thought I absolutely have to share with you. Um, in my opinion, it is one of the early candidates for game of the year. I'm sure there will be a lot of great games played this year, but at least for now, um, I haven't seen anything better than this. Um, it was played between uh, Grandmaster Sergei Volkov from Russia, uh, with white and uh, GM Bartosz Sochko from Poland as black in uh, Rilton Cup in uh, Stockholm on January 2013. And uh, this game is pretty interesting uh, from that aspect that uh, Sergei Volkov is uh, known as a brilliant positional player and uh, I don't think anyone could have expected him to do what he did in this game. So without further ado, uh, Volkov opens with d4, uh, knight f6, c4, e6, and we enter the Nimzo defense, and Volkov chooses f3. Now, f3 is by far the most uh, aggressive variation versus the Nimzo. So I'm sure that Sochko was probably a little bit surprised already at this point uh, to see that from Volkov. And uh, I'm not sure it might have been the tournament situation that urged Volkov to, to play as he did. Um, it was probably the case. Um, and uh, it produced a rather, rather brilliant game. So d5, this is all theory, I think. And uh, black plays... Black castles here, and uh, I think that uh, castling here is a little bit inaccurate. Um, I think uh, Black has to play c5 immediately to not let White, uh, you know, feel safe because White is so undeveloped, and castling gives him some extra time to develop. So um, he castles, and now White takes on d5 and goes e3. So uh, because castling is a small inaccuracy. Um, now white is able to uh, start his perfect development um, and uh, for white he really wants to simply put the bishop on d3, the knight on e2, the queen on c2, castle and uh, later on use his advantage in the center to maybe push e4 and just open the position up because he does have two bishops after all. Um, here black plays a rather strange looking move, but actually a really logical one. He plays knight h5. Now, you might ask, you know, why does a GM play the knight to the corner instead of developing his queen side, which would seem more natural. Uh, however, uh, the idea behind this, mo this move is simply to stall white's development, because uh, he creates a threat of queen h4 check, and, uh, of course, if g3 is played, then simply knight g3 uh, wins an exchange. So, for example, if bishop d3, queen h4 check, and now white cannot play g3 because the knight will take and the h-pawn is pinned. So, knight h5 is primarily directed at stopping white from playing his very natural bishop d3 move. And uh, white has to do something about the threat. Uh, he could play g3 himself, it's uh, definitely an option. Uh, however, after g3, you know, all these pawns on the third rank uh, look rather obnoxious, and uh, you know, white will probably have to develop with bishop g2 and uh, you know, knight e2 and castling, but uh, it's certainly playable. But I think uh, Volkov had something much more aggressive in mind. And so he decided to go for knight e2. Um, knight e2 stops the queen h4 threat. Now after queen h4, um, you know, he can play g3. Um, however, I have a strange feeling that uh, seeing how the game went, uh, you know, later on, I'm pretty sure after queen h4, he would have still done what he did in game. And you will see what he did. So... Black plays rook e8, extremely natural, uh, you know, putting the rook in front of the king, maybe later on, uh, hopefully, opening everything up in the center and uh, maybe pressuring on the e-file. And here, 
Volkov just blew my mind when I saw this move. Uh, I, you know, it's it's not so easy to make a good move for white here. It almost seems like you have to play g3 and then develop the bishop via g2. Because if knight from e2 moves somewhere, queen h4 check is again a problem. And uh, knight g3 doesn't seem so good. So, Volkov says, whatever. He goes g4. And this is rather amazing, because... I mean, queen h4 check seemingly gives black an absolutely excellent position, right? Um, since knight g3 will not be available because of the, of the same pin. And, of course, queen h4 was played because if black, you know, doesn't go for complications and play something like knight f6, then I think white just has a fantastic position. He puts the knight on g3, now the bishop will come out, as we talked about, he will castle, and, you know, the knight will be able to maybe even jump to f5 in some lines and stuff like that. So white clearly has an upper hand after knight f6. But, of course, the critical move is, and that's exactly what Sochko did, is queen h4 check. So Volkov goes king d2. And since the h5 knight is attacked, he has to drop back to f6. Now, if you look at his posi position, it seems like... You know, white has gone a little bit crazy in the opening. He has, you know, his king on d2, the pawn on g4. Seemingly, there's no no real coordination between the pieces, at least yet. And, uh, actually, let me backtrack a little bit. In this position, I think uh, black had an interesting idea of queen f2. Um, it probably doesn't work, but it's definitely worth a look. Uh, he's simply attacking f3 and e3 pawns at the same time. And so, uh, if white takes on h5, I think that uh, black certainly has some counterplay in lines like these, where, you know, he gets a couple pawns for the piece, the king is kind of wandering around still. Um, he might be able to get the third one, he probably will be able to get the third one if he wants. Um, however, I think that as long as white uh, withstands the immediate uh, threats, he should be fine, because, uh, you know, a piece is a piece, and uh, I think that black doesn't have anything substantial in this position. So, uh, Sochko didn't go for it, uh, he just played knight f6. And here I was really, really surprised by White's move, and uh, uh, after some thought I realized that it's very logical and good. Uh, White plays Queen e1. Now, it seems that White's opening strategy was to be extremely aggressive, uh, you know, get as much space as possible, and so seemingly Queen e1 doesn't fit with that strategy at all, because he's trading Queens, and Queen is kind of, you know, the epitome of... Uh, aggressive possibilities and, and such. So, but if you think about it a little further, if black decides to go for queen e1, after king e1, white has a very, very safe little advantage that he can push, because he has a massive pawn majority in the center, and he has two bishops, let's not forget that. And uh, his king problems are now gone, you know, he, he will be able to safely put the king on probably f2, the bishops will come out, you know, the knight will go to g3, and uh, black doesn't really have anything to show for it. And white will be able to, you know, just slowly squeeze this position for, for ages, till he finally breaks through, basically. And uh, seeing how Volkov is really known for, uh, for his ability to play such positions, I think that... Uh, Sochko realized that queen e1 uh, is not something he wants to play, because uh, seeing uh, how Sochko played the opening, it is also clear that he wasn't really interested in, uh, in fighting for a draw. He was definitely looking to complicate the position himself. So he plays queen h6. Now, queen h6, he retreats the queen, he's attacking e3. Um, now... It would seem that uh, maybe king c2 is a possibility to defend the pawn uh, with the bishop from c1, and maybe to threaten e4 in some cases. Um, but uh, Volkov was really, really 
in an aggressive mood, you know, because after king c2, I think that uh, black probably just gives a check on g6 maybe, um, and after the king runs somewhere further, probably something like c5 um, is interesting, or maybe knight c6 right away, something along these lines, and it kind of seems that, uh, you know, it's not so clear how to continue for white, his king is rather obnoxious. So instead, Volkov is being very aggressive and he just plays knight f4, which is both defensive and of course an attacking move, because now the queen on h6 is a little bit boxed in, at least for now. So again, Sochko was in a pretty aggressive mood himself and he shoots for c5. It's very natural, you know, white's king is stuck in the center, so uh, black is trying to open as many diagonals and files against that king as possible. Um, and uh, he does that at the expense of developing the queen side, but uh, it seems that the queen side will, you know, will be developed in a couple next moves. So if white doesn't do anything active, then simply knight c6. And it seems that black should have a really good position because the 4 pawn might actually be vulnerable due to various pins on the e file and uh, along the diagonal. So white plays bishop d3, again simply developing. And uh, here black played a rather natural move. Uh, however, in my opinion, it is a little bit slow. It seems that the position is very, very dynamic, and uh, somehow, I don't know, it seems to me that knight c6 was really the best move here. Uh, it's it's really simple, you know, black is simply developing, he is threatening d4, so white has to spend the move doing something about that. Um, and then maybe, in some cases, black has a chance to go for knight a5 to try to use the holes on the light squares. Uh, instead of knight c6, black chooses b6. Now, this move isn't stupid, the idea is very clear. He simply wants to play bishop a6 and uh, trade the light square bishop of white because white really, really has a lot of uh, holes on the light squares. You know, everything is kind of weak along the light squares. So if the bishop is gone, black should be able to abuse white on those weaknesses. Um, White responds with h4. Again, everything s now everything seems pretty pretty natural and forced. Uh, you know, he played g4 earlier, so naturally, you know, he has to follow up with h4, especially when there is an enticing, uh, you know, queen on h6, the knight on f6. And if we look at it, it seems that. Black's queen really is in trouble, you know, g5 is threatened and uh, the queen is a little bit boxed in and so, you know, black has to do something about it. He plays knight f to d7, which is probably the only move in that position. Um, you know, maybe, maybe there are, maybe there is a chance to do something like this. It probably doesn't work, I I would have to assume, um, because white probably can just simply play king c2 to solve most of your problems. Um, so since bishop g4 doesn't work and knight g4 doesn't work, uh, knight d7 is pretty much the only move. And here, uh, of course, the idea of knight d7 is to simply let the queen out, uh, probably to d6, and uh, here, I urge you guys to pause the video for a second and take a minute or two and uh, try to guess the next move that Volkov played, uh, because real fireworks start in this position. Okay, so uh, hopefully you are able to figure it out. Uh, firstly, we will talk about other moves uh, that were possible. Uh, probably the most natural move that uh, a lot of people would play would be simply g5 and uh, I'm sure I would probably just play g5 as white in this position. Um, and after the queen runs to d6, suddenly it is clear that it is not so easy to continue for white because his king is really starting to open up. The natural continuation would be something like h5, 
but it's not so clear where those pawns are going because even if we get g6 in black will be able to keep the files closed by simply taking with the f-pawn and then playing h6 well in the meantime I think that white might be in trouble due to an extremely open king uh, either immediately c takes d or maybe even maybe even knight c6 first for example and uh, again d4 is threatened knight a5 is annoying um, and it's not so clear how white proceeds with this attack also maybe bishop a6 is also an option uh, you know to trade the light square bishop so anyway anyway the move that Volkov plays in this position is just amazing to me. He plays bishop to g6. Now, to me that's, an, that's really a move of the year candidate, at least for now, um, because the, you know, the sheer audacity of, of this move is, is pretty amazing. Um, of course, it's not Morphe's queen g3, but, uh, you know, it's, it's still something. And... Uh, the engines agree that bishop g6 is the best move in the position. Uh, however, the engines also will tell you that bishop g6 isn't entirely winning for white. It only gives white a small advantage, according to the computer. However, you will see that the resulting position is incredibly hard to defend over the board for black. And that's why, practically speaking, I think that bishop g6 is pretty much a winning blow in this position. And... Uh, even though white still had a lot of work to do later on, it's more of a technique uh, than anything else, I think. Uh, so, of course, the idea of bishop g6 is simple. The queen is now completely boxed in. And uh, white is simply threatening g5 uh, to trap the queen, and there is not much that can be done here. Uh, if f takes g, the knight on f4 does his job, and after g5, the queen is still pinned, so or trapped. So f takes g is not an option. Uh, one could think that maybe queen f4 is an option after e takes f, rook e1, rook e1, and maybe h takes g. Uh, because now it se seems that black has gained two pieces for a rook. However, sadly for him, white has rook e8, and rook c8 with a completely winning position. So queen f4 is also not an option. So after bishop g6, h takes g6 is the only move. Now, of course, white naturally continues with g5. Black has to drop back to h7 or h8. It doesn't really matter a whole lot, I think, uh, because it would transpose. Uh, however, after queen h7, White plays h5, of course, that's the entire idea of the sacrifice, so that the queen is really boxed in along the h-file, and uh, it doesn't really have any good squares on this diagonal, except f5. So white really had to calculate what happens if black plays g takes h, rook h5, and queen f5. And uh, again, I would like you to stop the video, pause the video for, for a minute or so, and try to figure out how exactly is white winning if black chooses this line. Okay, so after queen f5, the win is really, really nice and smooth. Uh, white simply plays queen h4. Uh, the idea is, of course, to mate on h8, but queen h4 has another very important aspect. It is indirectly looking at the 7th square, which is the escape route for the black king. So uh, the only way to defend against king, uh, rook h8 mate is to play king f8, uh, because if g6, of course, still rook h8, and then queen h6 or h7 mate. So after king f8, white doesn't rush with rook h8, even though uh, he probably could, and it might, uh, it probably still is winning. Uh, however, White plays g6 here, and uh, the idea is really simple, you know, black's queen is attacked, and uh, mate on h8 is again threatened, because, again, queen is covering e7. So the only move is to play queen f6, uh, because queen is attacked and you have to gain access to e7, but sadly, that runs into a fork. So, 
I am sure that uh, when, Wal when Volkov played bishop g6, he couldn't calculate everything what happened in the game, uh, but I'm sure that he only calculated this line uh, up till queen f5, or uh, the queen f5 line, um, and he saw that it's winning for white, and so he realized that in the resulting position he will definitely have compensation, because if g takes h is, is not an option, which it isn't, black has to play king f8. And uh, here, of course, white plays h takes g6, and queen has to go to g8. So I'm sure that Volkov calculated the queen f5 line, uh, and he also saw this position, but here it is really hard for him to calculate something, because uh, there doesn't seem to be anything really concrete in this position. But I'm sure that, uh, you know, he used his GM knowledge and experience to realize that uh, he definitely has enough compensation for the piece in this position, um, basically due to the fact that pretty much all of Black's pieces are on the last line. Um, however, it is not so easy for white to continue. Uh, that's the that's the interesting thing. Of course, uh, he's a piece down. You know, he still has to find uh, active moves because it's not uh, he's not immediately winning. That's for sure. Um, and the move that is played next by white, uh, to me, it might actually be the most favorite move of this game. Even though bishop g6 is amazing. Um, but this move really shows how subtle the attack can be, you know. And uh, again, uh, pause the video for a little bit and uh, try to figure it out. Okay, so white plays queen g3. And to me this move is absolutely amazing. Um, because it doesn't seem natural at all, you know. It doesn't call for it. Uh, to me, you know, if I was playing white, uh, I probably wouldn't spot uh, queen g3, and I would choose something much more natural, you know, maybe something like rook h7, uh, with uh, queen h1 ideas or something along those lines. However, those positions are not so clear, because at some point, black can simply take on g6, you know, the king will run to f7, um, and, I mean... I don't know, position like this isn't so obviously clear to me, because even though white can probably go for uh, for a queen like this, but I mean, in this position, black actually has a material advantage still, and the attack is uh, at least somewhat gone, you know? As long as black is able to develop, uh, he has rook and two pieces for a queen, so, uh, you know, he should be at least okay as long as he doesn't get mated, and uh, it doesn't seem like he can be in too much trouble because white has a horrendous bishop on c1, and rook on, e1 on a1 also doesn't do anything. So, to me, you know, queen g3 is absolutely spectacular because uh, white finds an extremely strong resource uh, via the a3 f8 diagonal, and... Uh, you know, since Black has gave up his bishop, uh, this being a Nimzo, uh, his dark square bishop, he doesn't really have any chance to cover those dark squares, and uh, that's why queen, queen g3 is so, so strong. Now, uh, simply put, for example, if, white conti if, if Black continues f take g6, I think that there is a forced mate in this position, um, or at least a big win of material for white. So he simply takes on g6, king f7, and now probably... Actually, maybe rook h8 in this line is much better, since white's queen is already active, but maybe there is something more. Let's see. Now it's, pro it's probably rook h8 in this position, still, uh, except the difference is that since queen is on g3, white might be able to launch some, some attack, for example, uh, maybe g6 in this position, and it looks like black might have a really hard time coordinating his pieces after all. Um, so... Hmm. 
Black plays bishop b7 because, you know, d5 pawn is attacked, he thinks that he has to defend it, and there really there doesn't seem to be a better move. Um, in reality, it seems like uh, bishop b7 is the mistake, uh, pretty much the only mistake that black made in this game, because uh, apart from that, um, it's really hard to spot a move that was bad, you know, he was just kind of forced into this uh, very awkward defensive position. Um, so, bishop b7 is still followed by knight d5. And uh, the idea is very simple. Uh, if bishop d5, queen d6 check, and so the queen to g3 move now is really paying dividends, because after rook e7, queen d5, black doesn't have a way to defend a8 rook. Now, Sochko is a very strong grandmaster in his own right, so of course, when he played bishop b7, he didn't miss knight takes d5. He had a very cunning counterattack in, in his mind, so he plays knight e5. Now, uh, again, this is a very, very tricky move, uh, because, of course, if white simply continues d takes e, then, uh, if white continues d takes e, then uh, black probably doesn't have any problems at all, and he should be easily winning now, because uh, suddenly white's attack is completely gone, you know, there's no strong knight on d5, uh, black will simply be able to develop, and it's actually the white king that might be a bit more vulnerable than, uh, than the black king. So d takes c5, of course, is not an option, however, it seems that the easy option is simply knight e7, uh, knight c7 to, to fork the rooks. And however, I believe that here, uh, this is where Black's uh, hope of survival lay. Uh, he probably thought that he could launch a pretty powerful counterattack with his fairly well-placed pieces. So, for example, in this position, he could simply play something like knight a6, and uh, after knight takes a8, uh, maybe simply knight f3 check or knight c4 check, one of those two, and suddenly Black is only an exchange down, uh, so for example, uh, not sure if bishop a8 or rook e8, uh, let's just say bishop a8, for the sake of it, um, even though, okay, this allows queen d6 check, so maybe, maybe rook e8, rook takes a8, and if queen d6, simply king e8, and it seems that uh, black is only an exchange down in this position, and uh, White's king is actually a little bit vulnerable, you know. Uh, black is threatening all sorts of discoveries with the b7 uh, bishop. Um, he might simply, at some point, take, and take on g6, and, uh, you know, somehow the queen seems to start doing work from g8. Uh, so he probably, probably this is what Sochko had in mind when he played knight e5, uh, to give himself a practical chance to survive, because everything else is just really, really bad for black. However, Volkov didn't give him any chances at all. He plays a very, very accurate g takes f7. Now, there doesn't seem to be any difference, you know, when the f7 pawn is gone, knight c7 will probably still be, be the move. However, it is important to notice that only the knight from e5 can take f7, because if queen f7, of course, rook h8, this is very simple, but if king f7, white has a rather spectacular winning plan, so he checks on f4, and we see that black's king is in a real trouble, because after king e6, of course, just queen e5 is completely crushing, but if king g6, again, uh, I would like to, well, okay, I wanted you to solve it, but my, my chess base decided to show it for you, so... After king g6, it's made in free uh, by rook h6, queen f6, and uh, wherever the queen, wherever the king goes, either to h5 or h7, it's still made on h6. So the pawn on f7 can only be taken by the knight, and white simply plays knight c7 now. So the difference is huge because instead of having that super active knight on e5 which causes a lot of trouble with knight f3 and knight c4 ideas and all that, now that knight is stuck on f7. 
So, uh, this position looks very, very bad for Black, and uh, it looks like Black should probably resign, because not only is he going to lose, uh, you know, a Rook now, or at least it looks like he's going to lose some material back, um, but even more importantly, White is threatening G6. And if White is able to play G6, uh, Black's position will co collapse completely because if the knight goes away, queen d6 will be a killer on the dark squares. Uh, so again, Sochko being very strong player himself, he plays the best and only move that uh, can still keep his hopes alive, so he plays g6. Uh, not only does he stop White from playing g6, but in some cases he might even run to, you know, to that side with the king, maybe. Um, so, here again, you know, when I was when I was looking at this game, I mean, of course, my first thought was just simply knight e8 or knight a8 uh, looks really good. However, this is probably exactly what Sochko was thinking, um, because in this position, even though it seems that white or black king is really weak. In reality, there is just no way to get to it, and and that's what's funny, you know. Everything uh, is absolutely controlled by black, and suddenly, I would say that I would actually pick black in this position because as long as he can develop, you know, the knight to maybe d7, hide his king a little bit, he does have two pieces for the rook after all. Of course, it's a rook and two pawns, but with white king being rather weak. It seems like as long as Black gets some coordination between his pieces, he should be doing very well. So, Volkov again plays the best move. Volkov pretty much played all the best moves in this game. It was amazing to, to see. He plays d5. Um, and there are a lot of arrows now, so I'll try to explain them all. d5 is a amazingly multi-purpose move, you know, Volkov realizes that he doesn't really need to take that exchange, you know, because he sacrificed a piece already and uh, his super active knight on c7 is worth much more than rook on a8 or rook on e8. So when he plays d5, what he does is, of course, he creates himself a pass pawn, firstly. Secondly, he closes the light square bishop, which was a little bit annoying with with that, you know, influence on the a8 h1 diagonal. But even more importantly, he finally decides that it is time to get the dark bishop in play. And now, even after the best defense for black, which uh, which black actually did, the position is still pretty much hopeless because white is simply able to put the pawn on e4 next move. Maybe there is also an idea to put the pawn on c4. And the bishop, the dark square bishop, comes out either via b2 to h8 diagonal or via f4. And when that bishop joins the fray, black king is in really, really deep trouble. So black decides to go knight d7. Again, very natural. There is nowhere else to, to really develop. And again, white simply ignores, ignores the fork. And he simply pushes e4. So now he has this huge pawn chain from e3 to d5, which really limits black pieces. And he's ready to simply move the king away and bring the bishop out. That's exactly what happens after knight d to e5. He plays king c2. And we see that all of white's pieces are working very harmoniously. He will be able to play bishop f4. Then finally, the rook from a1 can also join the fray via d1 or e1, or maybe even doubling on the h-file. And even though black is a piece up, you absolutely cannot feel it. So, rook a c8. And uh, again, this is a good example of what uh, patience is. Seemingly, knight to e8 is something that most people would play in this position. But Volkov realizes his knight is much better than any rook, so he simply plays knight e6 check. Now, uh, king e7 is forced, because after rook e6, d takes e6, the knight on e5 falls. So, king e7, bishop f4, and we can see that black's pieces are completely uncoordinated, white controls pretty much all of the important squares. 
So knight c4, rook h4, maybe trying to use the h file to invade at some point, you know, either to double the rooks or play something like queen h2, maybe also possible. And also it's possible to make that rook work on the fourth diagonal after some timely e5 ideas at some point. Uh, so black plays rook d8 and uh, I find it funny that, uh, you know, black was trying to give up that rook for the knight for the entire game and white just didn't take it. So white plays a4. Uh, again, patience is key here. Uh, he probably would like to move the a1 rook uh, away if possible. Um, but also there is an idea for black after rook d8 to gain some very unpleasant counterplay via queen e8 and queen a4. So uh, a4 is a multi-purpose move. Um, you know, he moves that pawn away from being attacked, but also it blocks the a4 square from queen coming there. So black still plays queen e8, ties the a1 rook down to the defense of a4. Um, but really the position is just absolutely winning for white here and the rest is pretty much technique. So uh, he plays bishop c7. Now it's only a matter of time when white gets all the material back. Uh, it's just a question of how much interest will he get on it. Um, so black plays knight e3 check. Uh, if rook d7 trying to save material then queen f4 check is uh, a killer move because queen I mean, queen f4 is a killer move because queen f6 check, uh, checkmate is a threat. Uh, so black has to give up uh, the rook on c7, but that doesn't stall the attack at all because the knight will take on c7, simply drop back to e6, and all the threats will be renewed again. So uh, he decides to give a check on e3. White plays king c1, which is... Uh, there were maybe other options, but king c1 is as good as anything else. And now black decides to go for counterplay with rook d5. Now, again, uh, I'm, I was quite impressed with uh, Sochko as well, even though he lost this game as black, but he really tried to fight his way through it and find some interesting chances, you know. So it was pretty, pretty uh, interesting to see. Um, of course, he takes on d5, and now bishop takes on d5. And uh, it actually seems that black might suddenly be doing okay, because even though he just gave up a rook, he had a piece up, so he's only down in exchange at the moment. He's only down in exchange, and it also seems that the knight on e6 is attacked, and it doesn't really have good squares to go to, it seems, because... After knight f4, the bishop on c7 hangs, and after knight g7, something simple like queen d7, the bishop on c7 has to draw back somewhere along this diagonal, but then the attack seems to be pretty much over, while the white king is a little bit shaky. So, you know, when going for this line, white really had to see a nice tactic. He can play knight f4 after all, because if rook takes on c7, knight takes d5, knight takes d5, and even though the rook on c7 is now defended by the knight on d5, sadly for black he doesn't have a way to protect himself from rook e4, so the queen is lost. Um, and yeah, after knight f4, the rest is pretty much, pretty much technique, it's simply king d7, the material gets traded, and... Uh, it's not so interesting uh, anymore because all white has to do is avoid a couple checks and his two rooks and a queen will be able to mate this poor black king which is completely completely open um, and this is exactly what happens in a couple moves uh, actually queen f4 is a really really nice move too there are a lot of ways to win this position i am sure but queen f4 is beautiful since he's threatening to play queen b8 of course but also he's threatening to play queen f6 and also he's protecting himself from you know some random queen h2 check ideas where he still has to calculate some lines um so yeah queen f4 is really nice kind of gm move you know uh king c8 yeah queen f6 and uh there is nothing nothing to do for black anymore because uh 
after queen h2, king simply takes on c3 and there are no checks. So he tries the last trick, he plays queen h4. Um, now, of course, if king c3, then queen e1 wins the rook back, but uh, here white uh, could have probably simply played queen c3. However, queen c6 is mate in two. And that's what he did. So, I hope you guys enjoyed this game. Um, I really, really enjoyed it uh, when I saw it for the first time. I think bishop g6, uh, even though it is not, objectively speaking, it is not winning if we look at the engines, but uh, for two humans playing over the board, it is an amazingly, amazingly strong move. And uh, to even see that idea shows that uh, Sergei Volkov was really in a very aggressive and creative mood you know the idea itself is not so easy to see so again hope you enjoyed it and uh see you in the next one